Hello, this is Naomi. Hello, this is Juan. Hi, Juan. Hi, Naomi. Kimberly here. Hi, Kimberly. Let's see if you're recording. Is it okay? Yes. Sonia? Oh, okay. Well, that's good to know because I was going to highlight Sonia. Okay. Yeah. All right. So I'll actually highlight you, but and so Chelsea, you're going to go ahead and do that one slide about this. Okay. And please remind me of your title again. Uh, director of Environment. Okay, can everyone see the opening slide? Oh. I can. Okay, Naomi, and then you're on mute, correct? No. Yep, sorry. <laughs> I can. Thank you for reminding me. And then Annie, yeah, you that looks great. The mute, the mute button? Excuse me? Were you able to find the mute button? I um I did find it on my computer. Is there do I have to do it specifically through Zoom or can I just do it on my PC? Yeah, as long as we don't get the any voice feedback from your end then it should be fine. Okay. Yeah. I think I figured it out. Great, thank you. Oh, I think you can also manually. Okay. Okay, and then in the case that you're unable to figure out, we can also meet you on our end, Annie. So, okay, we have it covered too. Back up. <laughs> Great. Okay. A different color. Quick. Mm -hmm. I have a turquoise one. Right now, it's just practicing. What do you know? It's practicing. Because it says not broadcasting. Oh, I see. Yeah. Okay. And then Naomi, you will be coming yes. in on slide number nine, correct? Yes. Um, it's the one that says um, something about where the evaluations will take place. Great. Okay, perfect. And then Annie, just let me know, um, just say next, and I'll do the next slide. That way we can have a slide. Awesome, thank you. Fantastic. Okay. So we'll be starting up in the next two minutes. We are excited for this. Thank you all for joining yes. us. Woo! <laughs> <laughs> By the way, by the way, can we sing happy birthday to one? No way, really? Happy birthday to you. you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear one. Happy birthday to you. Woo! Uh, I don't know. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, yes. Okay. I, I never well, knew Las It was actually yesterday, everybody. So it was, it's but okay. we're faking it right now. Yes. Oh, belated happy birthday. Mm -hmm.
Thank you. I think it's still continues. It's can believe. I'm sorry? Can believe. Yes. Uh, if, if at any point I miss a critical thing about the Nature Explorer site at Lone Star or anything, please feel free to, to add something. Sure thing, but I doubt that's gonna, I mean, I, your slides are beautiful and you know the story and I'm gonna like use the intro that we have um, in the meeting invite, but no, just go with the flow. It's all nice. great. Yeah, so nice. I just saw Anaji, Anaji um, Yoshi just responded, Naomi, so she'll be there oh, soon. Great. Yeah. Anjali, yeah. Anjali. Awesome. All right. Out of this. You won't be. No? Okay, so, just, to just copy and paste the, the link. Okay, I think we're. All right, so we're going to go ahead and go live in three, two, one. All right, so. Welcome everybody. Um, for those of you who are joining us, this is the Healthcare Guarding Evaluation Training Webinar with um, Annie Hermanson and Naomi Sachs. Uh, my name is Juan Lasso and I will be your host for today. We'll be beginning in a couple of minutes, so please sit tight while we get everything started. Thank you for joining us. Good morning, everyone. Buenos dias. We are going to go ahead and roll out here with the Therapeutic Landscape Design Evaluation Webinar. Welcome to this exciting webinar, which is a part, it's part one of this two-part webinar series co-hosted by Corazón Latino and the U.S. Forest Service. My name is Kimberly Conway, and I serve as the Partnerships, Diversity, and Inclusion Specialist for the Conservation Education Program and in the U.S. Forest Service Washington, D.C. office. And today we're really excited to share this next step in a vibrant partnership among Nature Explorer, Dimensions Educational Research Foundation, the Arbor Day Foundation, the National Environmental Education Foundation, the U.S. Forest Service, and many others to build a Nature Explorer classroom at the University of Florida Health Shands Children's Hospital in Gainesville, Florida. And this is building upon the successes of the pilot project at the Lone Star Family Health Center in Conroe, Texas. The project at Shands and Lone Star will incorporate aspects of therapeutic landscape design, which will be guided by input from evaluation research conducted by Dr. Naomi Sachs. This two-part webinar series will train researchers that will be part of this evaluation research, as well as training others who have interests in this project area and these evaluation techniques. So today you're joining us for part one, which is the healthcare garden evaluation training or the garden assessment tool for evaluators, also called GATE. An evaluation we know is very critical for designers, for healthcare organizations, staff, and others to understand how well design intentions have been met and also to inform future design and research around specific design questions. So the, the garden evaluation tool developed by Dr. Naomi Sachs is a set of four standardized validated instruments that can be used for the evaluation evidence-based design, and research of outdoor spaces at healthcare facilities and beyond. The GATE tool is a scored checklist of elements that should be in a garden healthcare setting, and it is one of four of the HGET instruments. We are very grateful to our webinar co-host, Corazón Latino, and specifically Sonia Rangel, who is the Chief Operations Officer, and also Chelsea Mervain, who is the Director of Environmental Programs for their assistance in driving this webinar, and also to Juan Lasso, who is the U.S. Forest Service Partnership 
and Community Engagement Coordinator for the Conservation Education Program at the U.S. Border Service Washington office. We are grateful for his support as well. And now what I'll do is turn it over to, to Chelsea, who will provide us with some Zoom webinar guidance for the day. Hey everybody, uh, my name is Chelsea Morven, and thank you, Tamberly, for your lovely introduction. So, a couple rules uh, and housekeeping things that we're going to go over really quick. Um, while everybody, while the panelists are speaking, um, everyone else, please make sure that you're on mute. Um, and uh, if you have a question, please enter it into the chat box or um, into the Q&A box, and we will address those at the end of the, uh, of the program, at the end of the webinar. Um, so if you would just hold for a moment, we're having a couple technical issues on our end, um, so hold tight while we figure this out really quick. Okay, thanks everybody. Now we are going to uh, get started. Thank you so much, Chelsea. And now it is my pleasure to introduce our two inspirational speakers for the day. First, we'll hear from Annie Hermanson Bias, who is the Science Delivery Program Coordinator for the USDA Forest Services Urban Forestry South, Southern Research Station and Region 8 Partnership, located in Gainesville, Florida. Her work focuses on directing a region-wide science delivery program that develops and delivers information to increase our understanding of the interactions between natural and human systems in urban and urbanizing landscapes, including topics such as children and nature, human health and nature connections, outdoor learning, wild and urban interface, and much more. She leads the Kids in the Woods and Green Schools programs, at, which are extremely successful at both local and middle elementary schools, and is currently coordinating the development of and research related to the Nature Explorer classroom at the University of Florida Health Shands Children's Hospital. We'll also hear from Naomi Sachs, who is a postdoctoral associate at the Department of Design and Environmental Analysis at Cornell University and she's the founding director of the Therapeutic Landscapes Network. But beginning in the fall of 2019, Naomi will be assistant professor at the Department of Plant Science and Landscape Architecture at the University of Maryland, and we are so excited that she will be joining us in the DC area. Naomi is also the co-author with Claire Cooper Marcus of the book, Therapeutic Landscapes, an Evidence-Based Approach to Designing Healing Gardens and Restorative Outdoor Spaces. She is also the co-editor of the peer-reviewed journal, Health Environments Research and Design Journal. So with that, please join me in welcoming Annie Hermanson Baez. Thanks, Kimberly. Um, I'm really excited about the opportunity not only to present today, but also to be um, learning myself since I'll be helping a little bit with this research that Naomi's going to tell you all about. Um, but first I wanted to give you a brief introduction to Nature Explore in, in case any of you are not familiar with with that program. Um, it's a Nature Explore is a nonprofit program of the Dimensions Educational Research Foundation um, and many of the other partners that Tamberly um, told us about earlier. Um, the goal of the Nature Explore program is to support efforts to connect children with nature, and they do that by offering um, a variety of ser services such as outdoor classroom design. Um, they have natural products that, um, that go into those spaces. They conduct workshops and conferences, provide family resources and research and field testing. And you can see here several of um, the different elements of a nature explorer classroom. There are open areas, climbing areas, uh, building and messy materials areas, um, nature art, music and movement, and other and, uh, features such as entryways, gathering areas, gardens, and storage. 
And um, each of these um, classrooms are unique. They are designed by a team at each particular location during a design charrette. And then the Nature Explorer Landscape Architect takes that feedback from the participants and develops a final plan. Next. Um, and so to give you a little bit of background about um, the first medical facility um, that the U.S. Forest Service provided support for both um, in the design and of the outdoor classroom and the training of physicians and staff um, was at the Lone Star Family Health Center in Conroe, Texas. You can see there before picture and then after. Um, and uh, the project also inspired children and families to engage in other nature experiences, including visits to local forests and parks. So it's not just about the outdoor classroom itself, but also encouraging people to go um, out into the community and to, uh, into other green spaces. Um, there are several reasons why you say, well, why is the Forest Service um, supporting these kind of projects? Well, it helps the U.S. Forest Service generate awareness of forest service sites within the healthcare community, demonstrates the health benefits of spending time in nature, and enables those medical center providers to make connections between their patients and sites accessible to the community. Next. So um, after the success of the pilot project at Lone Star, um, the Southern Region of the Forest Service and the Washington office, they decided to um, co-fund another medical facility in the South, um, I mean, a nature explorer classroom at another facility in the South, and this time um, helping to help fund at a children's hospital. Um, after selecting several potential sites, we narrowed it down to our top three, and um, from that then selected Shands for many, many reasons, um, including um, the tremendous support we have had from the hospital um, and excitement that we saw from the physicians and facilities and the different partners um, that are going to help us develop this site. Um, next. Um, so we had a Nature Explore Design Charette and a workshop in Febu February of this year at Shands. Um, and in the charrette, we brought together hospital staff um, from a variety of different um, fields. We had administrators, nurses, physical therapists, occupational therapists, child life, child life specialists, pediatricians, facilities, and a lot of our partners that will help us with different aspects of the project, including uh, forestry, public health departments, therapeutic design, the Florida Forest Service, Project Learning Tree, many local natural resource agencies and more to help provide that input into that future um, Nature Explorer classroom. And then you see pictures here from staff that participated in the workshop um, that will highlighted opportunities for nature engagement in the future space. So where they are standing are all part of the area um, that were, will incorporate elements of the Nature Explorer classroom. Um, additionally, um, you know, that fine, okay, so the final plan for the, the Nature Explorer classroom was developed in April, and um, now we are just working on, you know, getting the planning stages. Um, the employees at, at Shands have been working with a contractor um, to make this a reality, and so the first phase of the project will need to be done by September 2019, but in reality, this project will go on as they incorporate different elements um, into the project with fundraising and things like that. Because really, when you develop a plan, um, you have your original plan, and then it tends to grow over time. Um, so they are excited about adding to this site from what we are able to contribute from the Forest Service site. And um, we also have, uh, I'm going to talk a tiny bit about the research, and that will lead into Naomi's talk. Um, we have a research team. We convened in August, and we're planning several um, research projects, one of them being therapeutic design uh, with Naomi. Um, also, um, 
uh, Lady Dr. Tara Sable Atwood at the Department of Global and Environmental Health is working with um, Wayne Zipper here with the Forest Service to look at environmental monitoring of the site. And we hope in the future to do some projects related to how exposure to this Nature Explorer classroom could reduce anxiety um, among patients, um, improve mood, and looking at social out aspects of outdoor play. And with that, I am going to turn it over to Naomi. Great. Thank you, Annie. And I am going to attempt to share my screen. Let's hope this works. Okay. Here we go. Um, so Annie or someone else who is not muted, can you tell me whether you can see this screen? Let's see, I'm looking in the chat box. Um, apologies, any technical issues? Here we go. Okay, thanks, Annie. I can see it. Great. Um, <clears throat> and just in case, for those of you who are not familiar with Zoom, um, if you hover your mouse over the screen, you'll see that this little box comes up. And if you hit the chat box here you can see chat and that's where you can ask questions and Sonia and Juan have actually shared the um, gate information here um, it's a through a Google Drive so if you want to click on that and follow along with the gate tool you are welcome to do that so I'm going to close that now and that's also how you can ask questions okay um, so the evaluations, first of all, thank you very much to everyone for attending. This is Naomi Sachs. And um, thanks especially to uh, the Forest Service and Tamberly and Annie and Juan and Sonia um, for pulling this all together. Um, so the, the first evaluation that we're going to be doing is at Shands Children's Hospital in Gainesville. And um, data collection is going to start either next week or January. Um, we're waiting to, uh, to hear back on a final date. And that will be both a pre and post occupancy evaluation, which I'll explain in a little bit. And then for Lone Star Family Health Center in Conroe, Texas, that will be a post occupancy evaluation. And at Unity Health, um, we are hoping very much that another Nature Explore site will be funded. Um, and we'll be able to do pre and post occupancy uh, evaluations there. And there we go. Okay. Well, I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time in this introduction um, information because I've covered it a lot before, and probably everyone who is watching this presentation. Um, knows a little bit about this uh, already and we're really wanting to get into the nuts and bolts of the training for the, the gate. Um, but just as a little bit of introduction, so nature in healthcare, nature is always important, but in healthcare it's all the more important because you're working with a very vulnerable population and when we talk about people in healthcare we're talking not just about the patients and the visitors but also about the staff who work there for uh, many, many hours a day and, and make life, uh, life challenging decisions, um, life changing decisions all the time. And so also just some terminology, when I talk about access to nature, I'm talking about both visual and physical access to the outdoors. So not just um, being able to go outside, but also being able to see the outside and know that there's something to go out into, even when you're inside. And then when I talk about interaction or connection or contact with nature. I'm talking not just about active interaction, so gardening, getting your hands dirty, but also passive. Viewing nature, just being outside, hearing the birds, feeling the sun on your face, and so on. There are many, many reasons why nature and healthcare is so important and access to nature. Um, to put it in a nutshell, Elements of nature 
normalize what is to many people a very foreign and scary environment. So it's, it's kind of a, a piece of home and a piece of um, what feels like normal life. Nature tends to be soothing and reassuring. It's life affirming. It provides hope and what's called positive distraction. So distraction from the things that are worrying you. It also provides people with a sense of control, which if you've ever been in a healthcare situation, you know that you're stripped of most control. And so it's really important to provide that to people in as many different ways as possible. And even just having that feeling of escape, knowing that you can get outside, get a breath of fresh air, go interact with nature is really important. And then it creates this biophilic connection, this connection with life and all living things. So the great news is that over the past 20 or 30 years, many healthcare facilities are starting to embrace this idea of access to nature, not just as icing on the cake, but as something that's really important and essential in the overall environment of care. So you, you started seeing, seeing healing gardens, um, they're also called therapeutic landscapes, or even now, which makes me very happy, um, facilities thinking about the whole property as a restored envi restorative environment. So not just the one little healing garden tucked away that no one can find, but the entire site from the entry to the parking lot to everything in between. And also incorporating other elements of biophilic design inside and outside of the building. Unfortunately, um, for those of us who know what good healthcare gardens can look like and what they should be able to do, we see a lot of not so good examples. And I put these two up simply because they are on the cover of two very well known. Um, healthcare design journals or uh, magazines, trade journals, and it's very frustrating um, to see things that don't necessarily represent best practices or the research that shows what really provides good outcomes. Um, and as far as we know, for all we know, they may even be causing harm. I'm not saying that these two are or that any are, but we just don't have the research to back it up. So some potential remedies for this disconnect between the research that we have and what's actually getting built, um, one is to have more research about evidence-based design and um, what elements gardens should have. Although we really do have a lot of research on that already. And so then another part is better translation of the research that we do have into practice. So how can designers and healthcare facilities access the information that's there and um, implement it successfully. Um, as far as doing the research, it's very hard for um, people to do randomized control trials and that other kind of quantitative empirical research on gardens, especially in healthcare facilities because of ethical issues and there are so many variables. So we need to be creative in employing other types of research methods. And one of those is garden evaluations, um, which are often in the form of post-occupancy evaluations. And there haven't been a whole lot. There have been maybe 12 in the past uh, 30 years, but they have been incredibly useful in providing information, not just um, sort of theoretically what might work and what doesn't work in a controlled setting, but here are gardens that were actually built and people who were surveyed and there were other tools that were used to find out what is working and what is not working so well um, in a real life setting. The other thing about evaluations is they promote accountability. So rather than just a healthcare facility saying, look, we have a healing garden, yay us, um, they hold that organization responsible and the designer responsible. Okay, you said you were doing these things. You, your facility says that this is a healing garden. Well, how does it measure up? And post-occupancy evaluations happen after a project has been built, usually about a year after um, the ribbon cutting when plants have had a 
a certain amount of time to grow in and the honeymoon period is over. And pre-occupancy evaluations are also important because they provide a baseline. So pre-OEs are done before construction even begins. And they provide that baseline so that then when the project is finished and has grown in a little bit, we can go back and do the POE, um, which is why it's so exciting with Shands that we have the opportunity to go and get that data um, for the pre-OE, and then we'll go back in a couple years after it's done. We'll go back about a year after that for the POE. Um, the other thing about these evaluations, uh, well, that one thing that we need to do these evaluations is to have instruments that are standardized and reliable and validated. So while the 10 to 12 POEs and pre-OEs that have been published are really useful, there we have to make a lot of sort of apples to bananas and oranges and avocados comparisons because very few have used the same evaluation tools. Um, this is not efficient. It, it ends up, we end up having to reinvent the wheel each time, and it makes it very hard to um, generalize findings. It also makes it harder for our field to have credibility if we're not using standardized instruments. So if we have standardized tools, then we can compare these two gardens that you see on the screen. They're very, very different gardens, but if we use the same tools to evaluate them, then we are using a similar baseline. Which is why I focused my dissertation on creating this toolkit of hospital garden evaluation instruments, which is called the Healthcare Garden Evaluation Toolkit, or HGET. Um, I should note that this, the HGET was developed specifically for general acute care hospitals. So some of the tools will be modified, for example, for children's hospitals right now. Um, the, the focus was primarily on what reaches the broadest population, which is a general hospital. Um, but then we'll be, get more specific about children's hospitals and uh, hospices, um, behavioral health care facilities, and so on, making those small changes that are necessary. So the tools that are in the HGET are the Garden Assessment Tool for Evaluators, which today's training is about, Behavior Mapping, which Monday's training will be about, Surveys of Patients and Visitors and Staff, which I don't think we'll be using at Shands, because that's just too, <laughs> too time-consuming and involved, and then Interviews. Um, these can be used for evaluation. They can also be used as design guidelines, especially the gate. And I'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, and then these tools can also be used for research. So to ask specific research questions and explore hypotheses and theories. And the HGET was designed for a broad variety of people. Um, including designers and healthcare administrators and staff and researchers, so that no future PhD student would have to um, <laughs> deal with developing these tools again. A little bit of background research that I did before I started the doctoral program. I've been the um, founding director of the Therapeutic Landscapes Network since 1999. And um, I think if you are seeing the exact same thing that I'm seeing, then the, this little box is hiding the, um, the URL. So the URL is uh, healinglandscapes.org. I apologize for that. And then before I started the doctoral program at Texas A&M University, um, Claire Cooper Marcus and I wrote this book, Therapeutic Landscapes, an Evidence-Based Approach to Designing Healing Gardens and Restorative Outdoor Spaces. And that was um, an excellent way for me to do a lit review even before I started the dissertation. Um, and so thank you, Claire, for inviting me to write that book with her. And um, that's a, a good resource for anyone who wants to do um, design or research on healthcare gardens and, and other gardens as well. So the four HGET tools, I'm going to go over really quickly a, um, just a synopsis of each one, and then I'll jump into 
the actual uh, gate training. The first of the four HGET tools is the gate, the garden assessment tool for evaluators. And it is a rated assessment, or you could call it an, a rated audit or checklist tool that has 96 of its individual items and five domains. The domains are here, access and visibility, a sense of being away, nature engagement, walking and activities, and places to rest. Those are rated on a one to four Likert scale, and I'll talk a little bit more about that. And they were, the gate was modeled on a similar audit that was by Claire Cooper Marcus and Marnie Barnes um, that they devised in 2012. And also Susan Rodick, who is one of my dissertation chair, um, she developed the Seniors Outdoor Survey. And so if you're doing research for gardens in assisted living facilities and other senior living facilities, I strongly recommend using Susan's Seniors Outdoor Survey, which you can Google and find, because that's, that was really designed specifically for outdoor environments for seniors. And as many of these tools, um, as it happens, there it's an iterative development of going back and forth and looking at the research and talking to people and testing it and then going back to the drawing board and psychometric testing, um, testing whether it's really working and how people are perceiving it and using it is a very big part. So behavior mapping is the second tool. And again, the training will be on Monday for that at the same time. And for those of you who don't know about it, you could email me or um, maybe put a question in the chat box and just uh, get information about that. So behavior mapping is a specific type of systematic observation um, where you're looking at who is doing what, where, and when in the garden. You need a minimum of two observers um, doing the behavior mapping, and preferably it's on two consecutive weekdays, like a Monday, Tuesday, or Tuesday, Wednesday, and then one more weekday about a week or two later. So you get a total of between eight and 24 hours of observation, and it's really helpful to, in addition to the um, the gate, which is more of an objective, what is here, what's working, what's not working, here you're starting to round out the picture and say, okay, so that's what we see um, more objectively, but this is how people are really using the space. And this is analog, it's just paper and pen or paper and pencil, um, which was because I, we didn't want to introduce a lot of technology because hopefully people will be using these tools for a long time and technology changes so fast, but for quite a while, we'll probably still have paper and writing utensils. Stakeholder interviews um, are structured interviews. So you have a very specific set of questions for the lead garden designer of the healthcare garden, the facility manager, who's often the one who knows um, most about what's going on in the garden day to day, and then a staff member who was on the original design team. And you're asking questions about what were the intentions for the garden? Um, what was the design program? What's going on? How do people use the space now? Do they use it? Um, in, if so, in what ways? And how is the space functioning? Um, are there any problems? Are there any issues? Are there uh, unexpected successes and delights that weren't even foreseen in the program? And then the final, instrument of the HGET is surveys. And as I mentioned, the surveys are rather involved because of IRB, which I'll talk about in a little bit. And it just, they just take a long time <laughs> to get done and to analyze the data. But time, if there is time, they're also incredibly rich, full of data. So um, the surveys that I did for my dissertation they were distributed online and paper, um, depending on the facility and the population. And they asked about awareness of the garden, so whether people even knew that the garden was there, um, how easily people could see and get into the garden, whether people used the garden, and if they did, how often and for how long, what people did in the garden, what they liked best and what they liked least. And then some outcome questions about whether they thought gardens were important, whether they were satisfied with the facility, um, and so on. And then because of 
a particular interest in staff use of the garden, there were some questions at the end of the surveys about um, people's views of staff use. So let's get started with the gate. And I hope some of you will have had a chance to pull up or download the gate on your um, from the link in the chat box, which again is here, hovering over it for a moment. And I'll be going through it, but just in case you want the overview and to follow along. So when I was talking with um, Annie and Lee uh, Deal, two people who will be doing the data collection at Shands, they said, you know, a checklist would be really useful. Um, so here is the, the preliminary checklist. This is a picture of um, a training that we did actually at Houston Medical Center um, when we were testing the gate. So the first thing you need is permission from the healthcare facility, from the health court organization. You need to have them on board. This is not something that you just go in secret and um, perform the gate and leave and then publish your findings. It's really important for people to know that you're there, why you're there, and so on. You also, in some cases for the gate, uh, in some cases not, definitely for surveys and for behavior um, mapping, you need IRB approval. So what the heck is IRB approval? Oh, all right. IRB is Institutional Review Board, and the Institutional Review Board's job is to protect human subjects from harm. Um, so some of you have probably heard of the Tuskegee study, um, which was called, the full name was the Tuskegee Study of Untreated Syphilis in the Negro Male. This started in 1932 and ended 40 years later in 1972. Um, basically, the uh, Public Health Service with the Tuskegee Institute told black men in Alabama that they were treating them for syphilis, but they weren't. Um, they, there were um, 600 black men total, 399 had syphilis, 201 did not, and they were getting these so-called treatments, um, which were nothing. And the real intent of the research was to study the bodies after people had died. Um, there was no informed consent. People were not aware of what the research um, outcome was supposed to be. And so this is an incredible, shameful part of our history. And it was in about the mid-1960s that a researcher found out about this and said, this is not right. Um, and that really is, and you can Google this, you can, there's the CDC has a page on this. There's an excellent book called Bad Blood um, by James Jones. So this is why we need the Institutional Review Board. And if you've ever gone through the process, um, it's, you know, it's a bit of a hassle, but this is why it's so important. So that nothing like this, that human subjects never get treated unfairly ever again. So I feel very strongly about that. Um, with IRB, you may need to go through, if you're with a university, like I'm with Cornell University now, and I will be at um, University of Maryland starting in the fall, you need to go through your own university's IRB, and you may also, you probably will also need to go through the IRB at the healthcare facility where you're doing the research. So often, once you do one, it's a much easier to do the second one, and they sort of play off of each other. Okay, so that's IRB. What else do you need for your gate checklist? Um, for any outdoor space research, it's important to do it on a good day. So it's really hard to do research, especially um, when people are out in the garden when the garden is cold and miserable and there's nothing growing. Um, right now I'm calling from Ithaca and it's snowing outside, so that would not be a good time to conduct the gate or behavior mapping. Um, so you want to do it at a peak growing time when things are really looking good. In good weather, um, it's hard for people to rate the garden, even if you're trying to be objective. If you're cold and miserable, it's hard to have a positive outlook and, and be objective. Um, 
it's good to do the gate when there are few or no people in the garden because having someone there with a clipboard tends to make people uncomfortable and you don't want people who are using the garden as a place of respite to be uncomfortable at all. Um, if you're doing the gate in tandem with behavior mapping, you wanna start with the gate and just, it usually takes about 20 minutes, get that out of the way and then start your behavior mapping for the rest of the day. So um, other things that you need, uh, at least one gate tool printed out, um, one for per evaluator. I always print out a couple extra copies just in case. Writing utensils, <laughs> I highlight utensils because um, someone's pen always dies or the pencil loses its lead, so it's good to have extras. A clipboard or other hard surface to write on and dress comfortably but professionally you know you're you're representing your institution and um, you want to look professional and you know sunscreen snacks all that good stuff uh, especially if you're there for quite a while doing behavior mapping as well as the gate you want to be prepared um, and be curious be open be flexible things always happen that aren't expected and if you go into it with an open mind and an open heart and um, some sense of adventure <laughs> then that's always that's always helpful another really important part of this checklist is that you do at least one practice run um, at a place that is not the garden where you'll be doing the gate so this practice run is what Susan wrote that calls calibration. And um, this is really a way to make sure that all of the gate evaluators who are working on this one garden are on the same page. They all have the same understanding of each of the individual items. And I'll use the cursor here to highlight. So the garden offers many places to sit. Hopefully, everyone who's conducting the gate at that particular garden will check strongly agree. And maybe everyone for this item, people can choose a variety of types of seating. They will all check somewhat agree. Now it's very rare that there's 100% agreement between all of the raters all of the time. But if you don't do this practice run at a space that is not the garden space where you're doing the research, because you don't want to you want that to be going in fresh. But you want to make sure that you're understanding each of these items before you go in um, so that you have what's called inter-rater reliability. And we'll have time for questions and answers at the end of the webinar. So um, we'll have uh, time if people have questions about that. So the gate is a total of six pages. This is the introductory page. And um, when you print it out, you can print it out in black and white. I actually have a PDF for printing out black and white. It's fine to print it double-sided. Um, just make sure you get all of the six pages. And the introductory page has this instructions and the demographics and the overall impression. So the Instructions, there aren't a whole lot of them, but it's important to follow them. The first thing, when you get to the garden, before you start walking around and before you start doing the gate, is to establish consensus on what are the garden's boundaries? Where are we stopping this evaluation? Sometimes the garden is completely defined by the buildings, and then it's very easy, right? The, the border is where the buildings start and the garden ends. But sometimes it's a little bit fuzzier, and so you want to make sure that everyone is agreeing on the garden boundaries on the main doorway. So often with a garden, there are two doors to the facility. So which one are you going to count as the main doorway? Um, or maybe there's one entrance that's from the outside and one from the inside. The main doorway should be a door from the inside to the outside, and it should be, hopefully there's a hierarchy, um, and you choose which one. And then the primary pathway, so which is the, the pathway that is the one that most people use? Um, and we'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that in a bit. The other really important thing is to walk through the entire garden before you start. Rather than just getting there and sitting down and starting to fill in the checklist, walk around. 
think about the garden not just from your own point of view, um, but from the point of view of a frail patient. So someone maybe who's in a wheelchair or very tired after surgery, very stressed, um, someone who has trouble getting around, walk through the entire garden, test the furniture, sit down in those chairs over there, sit down on that bench, listen, hear what's going on, um, try to think about what a child would see, and ask yourself how well does this garden support the needs of all of the users, so patients, visitors, and staff. I'm not saying pretend you're a garden user, but really try to empathize and imagine how this garden would feel for someone who is not so mobile. So then for your evaluation of the garden, you're going to check the box that best represents your level of agreement. And if you're not sure, um, you'll check an A. Um, I'll get into that a little bit more in a bit. And then um, we'll talk also about how to get the forms back to me. So that second part of the first page is the demographic information about yourself, um, your name, your role, um, whether you're a researcher for this project or a nurse or a doctor, um, the date and time, circled AM or PM, the weather, is it sunny, is it breezy, is it cold? Hopefully it's sunny and beautiful and perfect. Um, the temperature in Fahrenheit, and then also, you know, is it cool, is it warm, are you, is the garden in shade? Those can all make a difference. And then information about the facility. Um, here you would put the, the children's chance, children's, um, if the garden has a particular name, you might in this case put that it's a pre-occupancy evaluation so that we know which it is. Um, and if there are any other gardens in that facility. So perhaps there's an entry garden where people also are, or maybe there's an outdoor space, a courtyard outside um, of the cafeteria. You might make a note on the, of that. And then this is the final part of the first page, which is an overall restorative rating. So before you go into cognitive analysis mode with the rest of the gate, you're gonna start um, by what's your overall impression? Just kind of how does this garden feel? How would I rate it on a one to 10? So without thinking too much about it, what is your initial reaction? Um, so the rest of the gate, there are five domains. Um, and by domains, I mean at the top. So this page is access and visibility. And then the next pages are sense of being away, access to nature, walking and activities and places to rest. The subdomains are here. So visual access to the garden and physical access to the garden are the subdomains of access and visibility. And then each one of these statements is an item. And you will be scoring them here. You'll be checking, if you strongly agree with this statement, you would check here. If you strongly disagreed, you would check here. And just as a note, I don't write the scoring on here, but basically strongly agree counts as a four and strongly disagree counts as a one so once all of the rating the gate is done then you have you can take these numbers and add them up and divide by whatever i can't remember exactly and then you get a score for each individual item for the subdomains for the domains and for the garden as a whole with not sure oops sorry about that not sure or not applicable um, which is the last column if you don't know, like for example, the lighting at night, um, sometimes you can look and see how uh, there might be pathway lighting and you can see, okay, yes, there is lighting for nighttime, but you really can't tell whether the light shines into people's rooms at night. So you might have to put not sure um, or not applicable. Um, there may be some cases where you know, the garden is just a viewing garden. Um, or it's a garden just for staff, and there are some items that are just not applicable. But there's a balance between using this column um, where you, we don't want you to be guessing about something, but on the other hand, 
if you check it, then that counts as zero when you're doing the data analysis. So it can't count towards the score at all. Um, and so don't, don't default to this, I guess is what I'm saying. Um, and I am realizing that we are getting short on time and I want to leave time for questions. So um, let's see, just check the chat box. Okay. Um, so for each of these domains and subdomains, you will go through and agree or disagree with each of these items. So garden is visible from main public indoor areas. Um, for example, the lobby, a major hallway, um, the pharmacy. So when you're indoors, can you see the garden? And here's an example of a lobby or a, a waiting room where you would say strongly agree because it's um, that if this was the lobby, for example, that would be strongly agree. If this garden were in one waiting room but was not available from the lobby, you would click strongly agree, disagree, sorry, for the um, main public indoor areas, but from in areas that involve waiting, you might put strongly agree. Um, so most of these are pretty self-explanatory. I'm not going to go item by item, um, but you can certainly email me. I would encourage you if you're going to conduct the gate to read it through thoroughly before you even do the calibration with each other and make sure that there are no items that are that you have any questions on if you do have any questions email me and i'll be happy to answer them maybe we could set up a forum so other people could see them i'll think about how to do that um, and then do your calibration so that you all are on the same page and then hopefully everyone will be on the same page when they when they go and do the actual data collection of the garden oops all right so um, physical access to the garden, this is the second subdomain of the access and visibility. There are some unspoken domains that, that don't have labels, but in most of these questions, we're also talking about safety, we're talking about comfort, we're talking about a garden that affords choice and a sense of control. So a lot of these have to do, so for example, garden has an emergency phone. Believe it or not, not everyone has cell phones, and cell phones don't always get great reception. So it's still important for a garden to have an emergency phone, even in this day and age. Um, sense of being away is that sense of escape that people can have. Um, so part of that is having a sense of privacy and enclosure um, so that someone doesn't feel like they're in a fishbowl. Um, and they, they have a sense of, of being able to hold a conversation, being able to cry, um, being able to be with one other person or by themselves in the garden. And then aesthetics and maintenance. So if, if the garden is an unpleasant place to be, that's a very, that really impedes someone's sense of escape. Um, this garden is free from trash. This was, when we did our, our testing, um, kind of a sticking point because some people were so vehemently, vehemently opposed to any trash that um, they, if there were two cigarette butts, then they chose strongly disagree. So I'd encourage you to kind of um, really think about this, not only from your own personal um, opinions, but also, you know, really objectively. What, what is a lot of trash and what is a little bit of trash? Nature engagement, this is where you're really talking about the greenery and the green space um, in the garden. Walking and activities, so this is how does the garden afford or how does it provide areas for people to walk um, and to perambulate? Um, and when I say primary walkway, for example, this garden. Um, this is actually a patio off of a um, cafeteria. 
and it has been redesigned. It, there wasn't a whole lot to it before, but um, it's, it's better now. Um, but here we would have to define the whole thing as the primary pathway, right? Because there's no sort of circulating pathway throughout. It's just the paved area is the full area. So don't let that um, confuse you. And here, um, another thing that was difficult for people was to that um, gaps or cracks in paving are narrow enough for a wheelchair stroller or IV pole to cross smoothly. So you want about a one eighth inch gap um, and really think about, you know, if you have a stroller or something, how, how easy is it for someone to cross a gap? And it could be a gap like here where it's intended or it could be a crack in the pavement from um, lack of maintenance so it really doesn't matter whether it's an intentional or a non-intentional crack it's the question is can people cross this paved area easily or is there a hazard um, this is just a close up and this is being recorded. So I'm not going to go through all of these because I do want to leave a little bit of time for questions. Um, so the last domain is places to rest. And this domain is really about seating and also about social interaction. Um, you want to have a lot of different places in the garden for people to sit, to relax. You want to have choices so that some people can choose to sit um, in a group. Some other people might be able to just be by themselves or to have just two people. Um, sun and shade is something that a lot of gardens don't have, unfortunately, or they have too much of one and not enough of the other. Um, and so you want to, it's very important for gardens to have both and for, to, for people to have a choice. Um, so that they can be in the sun or the shade throughout most of the day. And you're also thinking about um, that the seatings aren't either bright white or metal um, that produce glare and that are very distracting and, and even painful for people who have sensitive eyes. Um, tables would be, and so for the yes, no questions, if a garden does not have any tables, then you would you would circle no, and you would not answer any of these other questions, or you could put NA. Um, but there are a couple other examples of that. For example, here, where there's lighting for night usage. If there's no lighting, then you would circle no, and you would not answer these two questions. So as it says, if no, skip the next two questions, and then I'll worry about scoring. <laughs> um, just on the left are a couple examples of seating. Uh, this is an Adirondack chair, which is very comfortable if you're um, able-bodied, but if you're not, they're very hard to get out of and into. Um, so, you know, that might get a little bit lower score for being comfortable um, or safe. Uh, on the lower image, you have a couple different examples of, their, you have movable seating, you have different kinds of seating. And so the last two subdomains, which I touched on already with the other slide. So before you fold this up and put it in a, a safe place, you want to go through the whole thing again and just make sure, did I miss any items? Are there any blank spaces where there shouldn't be? Um, when we did all, we did 25 of these in the Houston Medical District. And unfortunately, there was one where someone just forgot a, a whole page. Um, and so, you know, that was a whole page of missing data. So did you miss any items? Sometimes people say, oh, I, I don't know that. I'm going to look over the other end of the garden, and then I'm going to come back to it. But they forget. So go over the whole thing before you wind it up and make sure that you haven't missed anything. Um, you're welcome to write in notes. The Sense of Being Away page has a lot of white space on it, so that's a good place to write notes. But if you do write in some notes, just make sure that you and especially someone else can read them. So when you're done with the gate, tuck it away, because this is a hard copy for now, and scan them in and send them to me. Um, and we'll put my email up at the end. Um, I will do the data entry into Qualtrics, which is like SurveyMonkey, it's a, a survey platform, and then tally up the scoring. 
We will eventually have an app so that people can do this on their phones or iPads, but that's still in development. Um, and then for those of you who are doing the gate before the behavior mapping, you will start behavior mapping. Um, and we'll have that training on Monday at 11 a.m. So we have a little bit of time for questions and comments, and I'm hoping that some people might be able to stay a little bit longer. Um, I'm happy to stay longer to answer those. Um, a sincere thank you to so many people who helped with this um, for this webinar and for the grant um, to do the research on the Nature Explorer sites. Thank you to the Forest Service, to Corazon Latino, to UF Shands Children Hospital, Children's Hospital, to Dimensions Education Research Foundation, which hosts the Nature Explorer, um, to NEF, uh, Park RX America, to Cornell University, and Mardell Shepley at Cornell. Um, to Susan Rodick, Mardell Shepley, Chanam Lee, and Jume Zhu, my dissertation committee, to Claire Cooper Marcus and Marnie Barnes for all of their wonderful work and for creating the tool that I was able to base the gate on, and for some folks who funded my dissertation research, the Tuttle Fellowship from the AIA and the Center for Health Design. So with that, I'm sorry to have gone on a bit long, but I think we have some questions in the chat box. And yes, thank you so much, Dr. Naomi Sachs. Um, I can go ahead and read off some questions, and if you have some time, we can answer them right now. Great. And everyone else who is on the webinar, please uh, know that we will be recording this webinar. We, we will send that over to you in case that you're not able to stay. Um, but in the meantime, we can answer one or two questions. So, one of the questions that's being asked is, um, is there a radius of proximity that gardens need to be by uh, for a healthcare facility to collect data for gate? That's a really good question. There is not technically, although the farther, the f really the gate is meant for a garden that is right adjacent to the facility. Um, I have done the evaluation when we were doing the testing on gardens that were even across the street from the hospital. But if you do that, then that whole first page, the access and visibility, there are a lot of not applicables, right? Because you often can't see the garden from the, um, the facility or you can't, you can't really answer the question of does the garden, uh, does, is the door too heavy or are there automatic doors because you have to cross a whole street in order to get to the garden. So I would say it still can be done, but it's really, ideally the garden is within, well, it's either right directly adjacent to the building or it's within 50 feet. Thank you. And a question that was asked by Mike Hill from the US Forest Service is- Hi, Mike. Do you believe that, or have examples that the gate uh, can be used effectively for gardens that are not in healthcare facilities? That's another really good question, and I, I know why you're asking that. <laughs> um, so there are, my intention is to develop a gate tool that is not specifically for healthcare. Really right now, it is more for healthcare. I think that there are many elements of it that could be for non-healthcare settings, but there are enough um, that really focus on, for example, you know, the, the concern about um, water features and spray. That's really because in healthcare facilities, you have people who, so many more people who are immunocompromised. And more spray from water fountains um, releases more Legionnaire, Legionella bacteria into the air, and that can cause Legionnaire's disease. And that's something that, for example, in a public park, someone who was really immunocompromised just would not be going to that park. Um, and so it's less of a concern. Um, so there are definitely things that would be taken out and perhaps also other elements that would be added in. So Mike, if you wanna work with me on that, um, that, that would be great. But I think now you could use it, um, but it would have to be sort of, you know, with a grain of salt or several caveats. I know that um, John Henderson 
and Park RX America are trying to develop some sort of audit tool that is for more general public spaces. Um, so that, that might be another route to go. Thank you. And then continuing in line with uh, Michael, he also asked and was wondering whether the surveys were distributed in multiple languages and to different ages, and would it be beneficial to perhaps have the gate tool translated in multiple languages? Another great question. Um, the gate tool, it would be great to have it translated into other languages. I think, uh, especially Spanish, it was my intention when I was working on the dissertation to translate the surveys into Spanish. That's quite a process because you have to translate everything into Spanish by uh, someone who is fluent in Spanish. And then you have to have someone else translate it back into English to make sure that it's, that you have that validity and reliability. And just with the dissertation, I ended up not having time. And also with the facilities where I was doing the surveys, um, there weren't as many Spanish speakers as, for example, if we had done it at um, Unity in Washington, D.C., that would have been absolutely critical. Um, and the gate as well. I think if, if someone wants to help with that, I would, I would love it if we could get some of these things translated into other languages. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Um, and then we have one last question. And um, are these standards that are being used for the gate tools uh, international standards? Gosh, um, no. <laughs> I would say they, I mean, the gate can certainly be used in any country, but every country has its own different cultural aspects. So for example, in a, a country that was with many devout Muslim people, the gardens would probably be gender separated. And that would be a really important thing to add if we were doing a lot of garden evaluations, for example, in Saudi Arabia, um, or perhaps in an Orthodox um, Jewish hospital, even in this country, there might be separate spaces um, by gender. Um, so uh, I think in general, the gate and, and the other tools translate to other countries. I don't mean language, I mean sort of culturally. Um, but anytime that you start to really go outside of the U.S. Um, or perhaps the U.S. and Canada, you want to make sure that, that you're being culturally sensitive and appropriate. Um, and I think actually, Mike, you also asked about whether children filled out the surveys. Um, so the surveys that we did of patients and visitors, we only had IRB approval for um, people over the age of 18. So it may be that parents, we didn't have any identifying information. So it may be that parents filled out the surveys with their children or that a child did fill out the survey, but clicked that they were 18 or over. Um, we don't know. But if we did do surveys for children, which if we did do surveys at Shands or Lone Star, we might want to um, have children fill out the surveys, then we would need to get institutional review board approval because it's a little bit more stringent if they're um, children or people with um, learning disabilities or prisoners, any, any type of people who are even more vulnerable than other vulnerable populations. Um, and I see one other a question about, oh, how much time is needed to complete the assessment? So the gate takes about a half hour, sometimes even less. But to do a, a really thorough job, I would leave a half hour. But that's assuming that you have already done the calibration. So you've already done at least one trial run at the garden that's not your study garden, um, preferably two or three. And that takes longer, the calibration, because you're filling out the gate and then you're spending probably another half hour to maybe even an hour going through every single individual item and saying, what did you put for this? What did you put for this? Oh, well, we put the totally two opposite things. Why is that? Let's try to figure out what was the misunderstanding. Thank you. And I see 
one more question from Mike. Do you feel that the gate could be used as a pre-design inventory tool to shape a garden design? Yes. <laughs> so that, that was one of the reasons for creating the gate um, is that it could be used as a, in a way, a checklist. And I want to caution people that um, it does not contain everything that should be in a healthcare garden. Um, for example, there's nothing about poisonous plants. Poison is really important, especially for children's gardens or people with dementia, that there not be any poisonous plants in the garden. But because the gate was designed for a wide variety of users, including people who have no knowledge of plants, um, we wanted to take out as many of those items that, that would just be, someone would just sort of say, well, I have no idea. Um, and even a landscape architect who is familiar with East Coast plants might not know what West Coast plants were. So um, the, the book that Claire and I wrote, Therapeutic Landscapes, has a much more um, thorough group of design guidelines that I would encourage people to refer to when they're designing any sort of healthcare garden. But the gate can certainly can be and should be used as a, a sort of starting point. If you hit all of those items, then you've got a pretty good garden. Great, thank you so much. Um, now we will close out with a few remarks from Kimberly Conway. Uh, Kimberly, please go ahead. Thank you, Juan. Doctora Sachs, thank you. <laughs> Such a vibrant research-based focus to really highlight the opportunities that we have to unite nature explorer and therapeutic landscape design. So we're just really grateful that you bring this to us that will help us to better serve patients and their families. And then also, you know, the healthcare providers and staff at these facilities and also the surrounding community. So we're really grateful to both you, Naomi and Annie for joining us today. And we're grateful to everyone who's been mentioned here today and for the shared vision among so many incredible partners and individuals who've helped to advance this effort. Um, I know that John Warner is out there from the Texas A&M Forest Service. Thank you for joining today, John. I know you'll be uh, venturing off with Dr. Dan Porter at Lone Star um, in this evaluation. So we were grateful for that. And to everyone, if you will, please join us again on Monday, December 10th from 11 to 12 p 11 a.m. to 12 p.m. Eastern time for part two of the healthcare garden evaluation training around behavior mapping. So again, we thank everyone for joining us today and for sharing this information widely with folks who you know will benefit um, from this overall effort. Thanks everyone, muchas gracias. Thank you. Thank you.